Right, we're here at Swartston Nursery again, and there's no one better to tell us about tips for those plants and them um, pots and for the garden. Now, Mark Smith is here, and Mark, what have we got uh, advice for us this month? Well, this month uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, water saving and and, uh, and saving water in general, which is always a good good idea. It's always good to try and uh, use up natural resources, and rainwater is fantastic for plants anyway, rather than using it out of the tap. And and generally I've come up with some few tips where you can use less water in the garden makes it less work because a lot of people don't like uh, watering the plants in the garden they find that it's a little bit of a chore uh, so first of all the very very simplest uh, tip is uh, whenever you're planting um, um, plants in the garden uh, trees, shrubs, even bedding plants use bark this is uh, just ordinary decorative bark there's nothing special about this but if you leave a good thick layer of a couple of inches around the base of each plant make sure the plant is really well watered in um, and then apply the bark after that and that retains the moisture keeps the moisture in there less chance of it drying out um, when you get a breeze uh, on so warm summer, summer's days it dries the ground out a lot easier with bark it stops that and of course the added bonus of putting bark uh, down uh, apart from retaining moisture is it uh, keeps the weeds down so yep. less maintenance and also uh, in winter it acts like a duvet a blanket keeps all the frost out so it protects a lot of plants from uh, getting frost damage around that's the roots good. that's great um, so that's that's a very very simple thing to do and I, and I would always recommend doing that regardless of whether you're trying to save water uh, or anything because uh, well, putting bark around the base of plants is always a good uh, a good tip anyway. So what other tips have you got for water saving or well, cutting back on water? Cutting back on water you can save rainwater and rainwater like I said is great for plants it makes them look a lot healthier if you're uh, using or you like uh, ericaceous loving plants things like rhododendrons, camellias, azaleas they all like rainwater rather than tap water because tap water can be quite limey. Uh, so to collect rainwater you have water butts. Now this is a slimline water butt, it takes up less space in your garden uh, because water butts tend to be quite uh, bulky but this is a slimline one on a stand and you would uh, channel any water that you've got from your, your guttering on your house or in your shed, your garage, your greenhouse, any of that put a uh, water butt right next to those. You don't, um, most, uh, I've got three in actual fact. I've got one uh, collecting from the garage, one from the shed, and uh, one from the house as well. It gives you lots and lots of water when it is raining. You can store that, keep it in the water butts, and you can use it on really uh, warm, sunny days. Um, if you don't want something that looks too industrial, uh, that one does look a little bit unsightly, uh, you can have these new decorative ones. This is a, what looks like a, a, heart, a barrel, basically. This is quite decorative, looks really nice, and it isn't uh, too intrusive, and uh, it, it's... It, almost adds a nice feature to the garden uh, so uh, that's a, a really nice thing I'll, I'll be upgrading to one of those eventually because I've got quite a, a green industrial looking one um, and again uh, what most people tend to have are um, watering cans most people have watering cans they come in all sorts of funky colors these days uh, but uh, it's always better to use a watering can than a hose because hoses can be quite wasteful they use a lot of water but if you go to the outside tap or in the kitchen and fill up a, a watering can you get that you can actually measure these Oh, for big plants in pots, I would always put uh, two watering cans full per pot. And it is a lot of walking backwards and forwards, but you do sell, save a lot of water. Um, the, uh, the next uh, thing is uh, quite a new product. Uh, this is a leaky hose or soaker hose. Um, it's basically a black sponge uh, hose pipe. Uh, this is great for lawns rather than using a sprinkler, which again is quite wasteful and uses a lot of water. If you um, undo this and trail it out backwards and forwards, snake it across a, a lawn and leave the, the hose on, it just drips. Rather than sprays water out, it just drips. And just that amount of water is just perfect just to keep uh, the lawn uh, looking particularly nice. And also you can drip this if you've uh, planted a new hedge, for instance. Hedges uh, require a lot of water when you first plant them. You can trail this along the base of the plants, turn it on, and it just gives them the right amount. And you would leave that on for an hour, and you think that's, that uses quite a lot of water, but it's only drip, 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 slow mm. drip. And that's much better than trying to flood uh, the plant. So 
I was going to mention that about yeah. the measuring of the, you can with the water tank you can measure the water out, but with the hose it's just constant running, isn't it? Yeah, it is constant running. I mean, you can uh, you, there's a, another one which is a micro hose, which again uh, uses less water, thinner pipe, uh, but you can use these with a timer. Uh, so, or if you can remember yourself, to, uh, you know, to turn the hose off. Better to use a timer because there's no that there's no uh, error in forgetting to turn the uh, the hose pipe off. Um, but it. On the, um, on the timers that you can buy these days, the new modern ones, it can actually tell you how much water you want to use rather than a timer. So uh, if you want to use so many gallons per, per plant, you can set it for that uh, amount of water. It does a measured dose and then shuts off, which is a great idea. Um, but uh, it can be quite fiddly if, it's, if you've got many, many pots. So uh, use a, a micro hose or a soaker hose, but you will find that a soaker hose actually uses 80% less water than a regular hose pipe. Right. So uh, if you're on a water meter, it's absolutely perfect. A really, really good, good idea. Um, again, another tip that uh, most people say, well, of course I know about the sources and things like that, uh, but if you've got a pot, so you've got a container garden like what I've got at home, um, having a saucer underneath is fantastic because when you water the plants, you get the excess, drains into the uh, saucer, and using capillary action, the plant draws it back up again as it needs it. Right. Because um, a lot of people, you see lots of people having pots in the gardens, they've just got the pots there, you water them, and all that excess is running away over the paving and being wasted. But a saucer just gathers the water. They're not just for indoors, because people tend to use them for indoors. You use them outside, cats captures the excess water or even rain water and, uh, and then the plant takes it up using capillary action as and when it needs it so it's a very very basic um, piece of equipment but it's well worth using so what's your preferred method of watering is it the tank or the hose which would you prefer um, I, I prefer the soak uh, soaker hose because okay. it seems to really drench it and if you if you only put it on for say half an hour uh, each day which again sounds like a lot but when you're using 80 percent less water it's not much at all um, but you get in the the soil constantly moist and that's better for plants rather than let it dry out soak it thoroughly dry out soak it thoroughly so uh, using the soaker hose is much better you, you're getting a lot less wasted uh, water um, I do like using the watering cans as well because I've got a lot of big pots and it's just a mental note to use two full watering cans per pot and you know they've had enough then because most uh, pots tend to be big pots tend to be 15 to 20 litres in size, well a, a regular watering can is uh, 10 litres, so you know that you're filling the pot full of water and that's exactly what the plants need. Okay, moving on Mark, um, and we've got hot summer at the moment, really hot blistering sun, um, you know the plants need more watering than anything else, yeah. but have you got any drought tolerant plants? Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, quite a range of drought tolerant plants, there's actually a lot more than you, you, you can imagine. Um, most people would uh, think of uh, palm trees uh, and those kind of things that are, are drought tolerant because they like the uh, hot dry uh, conditions. Palms you can leave for a week to two weeks, they're great if you're going on a holiday, they're great for containers absolutely perfect this this what we've got here is uh, what's called a chinese fan palm um, this is uh, trachycarpus excelsior uh, very hardy palm as well this uh, can survive down to minus 20 mm. so perfect palm uh, for that uh, kind of uh, situation um, Moving along, we've got uh, hebes. Now, hebes are one of the most popular plants that you, you see in garden centres and nurseries. We sell a, a lot of them uh, here at Swartz Nursery. They give you lots and lots of colour, but very, very drought tolerant. Right. When, uh, in terms of drought tolerant, they do scorch and they do go brown if they dry out, but they recover very, very easily yeah. uh, it, when you do uh, water them again. So if you just forget and they start to look a little bit dry, water them and they soon spring back to life. Um, and again, moving along is um, the other type of plants that are great for uh, dr uh, drought tolerance is um, the Mediterranean type plants. And, and you th that's uh, thymes, rosemary, lavender. Uh, this is French lavender, different type of lavender. And we have uh, the Santa Lina there. They're all from the Mediterranean area, so again, Love, love the sun, uh, mm. not too fussed about having too much water, so you can leave those for a number of days before they start to suffer. And again, 
when you do water them, they spring back into life very, very easily. Uh, but you can, uh, of course, you can use them in cooking as well. Uh, but all those scented herb type uh, Mediterranean plants, absolutely gorgeous in the garden, but great for drought tolerance. Uh, we've got uh, a blue uh, evergreen um, grass here, ornamental grasses, Festuca glauca, uh, very steely silvery blue. Because it's very, very thin leafed, requires less water as well. Um, great in a very well drained uh, position. So with all the drought tolerant plants so far, yeah. how often do you have to water them? Um, in an ideal world, you, you would water them probably uh, once every two days, something like that, to, to keep them absolutely pristine. Uh, but if you left them for a week, it wouldn't really matter that much. Uh, you know, if you forget or you're going away for a couple of days, absolutely perfect, wouldn't uh, affect the plants at all. Uh, if they're newly planted plants, you buy them, uh, you know, very, very elite recently, obviously you've got to look after them. If these were established in your garden, they would last for a week or so without right. any problem at all. Right. But young plants, you would have to keep watered probably once every two days, something like that. If you needed something for the uh, for the wall or uh, or fence, we've got passion flower. Passion flower looks very very exotic. Um, it is an exotic looking plant. If it's in a very warm uh, position, will produce fruit as well. But great drought on the plant. Again, the leaves will wilt, but it won't kill the plant. Um, it would uh, just simply reshoot uh, new leaves if all the leaves went brown. We've got uh, another kind of palm here. This is the Australian palm, which you see in a lot of people's garden. Very, very popular palm. Again, drought tolerant. Mm. Um, very, very difficult to uh, kill uh, cordelion palms. Even with the harsh winter that we had two years ago, lots of people thought they'd died, but they've sprung back into life again. The, uh, the, the, the laugh at uh, not being watered for a long, long time. So ideal for people who don't particularly like watering, container growing uh, plants, uh, you know, which tend to dry out very easily. Cordial lines are an absolute must. And I noticed on these you get all this fraying at the end. What's all that? That's, that's a natural um, uh, recurrence with the palms. All the palms get it. They get these little brown uh, tips. Now, Eventually palms that form a trunk and the lower leaves go brown so they're, they're starting to go brown and work their way back to the trunk and then you pull those leaves off and that forms the trunk. Right. What you can do if you don't particularly like that is just simply get a pair of scissors and do a diagonal cut and just take out the, um, the those unsightly leaves. I mean that will stay good looking for a number of weeks. It will eventually go brown and then you form the trunk but uh, it just makes it less unsightly. Um, and that's it, not killing the plant at all? Not killing the plant at all, just takes that unsightliness uh, off it because it does look uh, quite sickly when you get these mm. brown tips but that's perfectly normal and there's, uh, there's not a lot you can do about that. Okay. Um, moving along, uh, another personal favourite of mine is this. This is a Belia Kaleidoscope. Great drought tolerant plant, always looks fresh. This is the, the summer growth, uh, looks very, very limey yellow, has a, a um, uh, like a, um, a tubular uh, flower on, pink flower on. But when it goes cold in winter, it's an evergreen plant, when it goes cold in winter, it goes a really vibrant, deep red. It almost looks like totally two, uh, totally two different plants. So uh, great plant, I've got this at home, always succeeds, always looks healthy, uh, fantastic. Now Nice and colourful. Nice and colourful, N yeah. Nice summer plant. Yeah, that is uh, a good summer plant. Very mm. vibrant, very uh, showy looking. All the new growth is uh, bright orange as well. Um, again, uh, a lot of people have problems with uh, dry areas uh, in the garden, which is very, very shady. Now, this is Euphorbia. Um, this one is um, Ferns Ruby. And if you touch that, Graham, it... it uh, it feels very, very soft and it's very tactile. Smooth. Very smooth yeah. and it's lovely. I absolutely adore this. Stays very, very compact. There's no maintenance at all. Plant it, leave it, forget about it. But great in deep shade. So you've got those areas under a tree that gets very, very dry. That's the plant that you need. Um, <laughs> moving on is a um, Nandina uh, Domestica um, Obsession or Obsessed. Uh, deep uh, red new growth, uh, evergreen great drought tolerant plant uh, really really withstands a lot of dry year. I've left this uh, in pots uh, for almost two to three weeks before it ever starts to look uh, um, you know worryingly dried out so very very tough plant uh, can withstand a lot of uh, dry weather 
Um, if you want a little bit of fruit in your garden, uh, obviously we have citrus. We've got uh, we've got lime here with a, a lot of limes uh, appearing on the plant, and we've got a very very easy to grow uh, lemon. This is Mayer's lemon uh, with a, a lemon form in there. Great because you get the scent. The drought tolerant, these actually, the, the leaves wilt over as though they are drying out, so it gives you a good signal that they are drying out, but doesn't harm it. They can almost, all the leaves tend to fall off, which mm. looks quite alarming, but you water them almost immediately and uh, they get to bright green new shoots again and look very, very healthy and sprightly. So, uh, good drought tolerant uh, plant there, but it is a citrus, so it's uh, like the hot, dry countries. We've got uh, an ornamental uh, banana plant there, which is a little bit uh, um, tropical, but uh, ornamental bananas, again, drought tolerant, love it dry, uh, perform better and they grow faster if they're in a drier position. If you keep them well watered, stay stunted, you let them dry out, they grow a lot taller. So uh, a great uh, plant there, that's uh, ornamental banana. Another uh, variegated palm here, this is another cord lime, but this is Dazzler. So if you want a little bit of colour, so a lot of uh, plants tend to be green leaf, but this is a nice striped, creamy uh, cord line. Uh, again, drought tolerant. And uh, of course, uh, what we have next to you there is um, an olive tree, uh, which again can survive weeks and weeks and weeks without any kind of water at all. Uh, does perform very, very well. When you water it, it sends out a flush of new, uh, lovely green growth. Uh, but you can get this in a bush or as a, a tree, as we've got there. One of the most perfect uh, drought tolerant plants that you could uh, plant in your garden. Feels very dry. Am I sweat at the moment? It's wet in the moment. Yeah. We've uh, we've watered that because that does encourage uh, a little bit of new growth. But it almost goes into stasis when it goes dry, and uh, it I'll, it must be about two or three weeks uh, that uh, we've watered some of those outside, and they're in a very very dry compost. You think they're going to die, but they survive and they, they look lovely. It's looking great without the water. Anyway. It is, yeah. It's, uh, it's a really nice, attractive uh, plant that has the flowers, and it also has the olive fruits on. If we have a very long, hot, dry summer, looks very rough. Uh, flower there, at least. Uh, uh, yes, it's a very coarse leaf, and that's that's like uh, a lot of uh, Mediterranean type plants have this very tough, uh, coarse leaf, and that that uh, helps the plant withstand very hot, drying winds. And if it was a very delicate wind, then uh, leaf, then it'd get scorch. So it needs to have a very rough, almost uh, leathery kind of leaf, and that protects it from the heat and the uh, and the strong winds. Okay, Mark, how does it come about? that you choose plant of the month out uh, of all these thousands of plants you've got basically it's uh, anything that you that's very very easy to grow um, and uh, the it's you can almost have it in a container so almost anybody could have it it's no good having a plant that grows absolutely huge and you couldn't have it on a, a balcony for instance so it's very very carefully selected that literally anybody could have it in anybody's garden they've always got a spot for and it and is it difficult to choose very difficult to choose. Usually there's too much choice and it's always uh, wondering which one to go with. Uh, but I always try and go with one that's a personal favourite of mine and I know that succeeds and will always do you proud and comes back year after year. So what is it this month? Well this year, uh, this uh, month it's um, Agapanthus which is uh, a personal favourite of mine. Uh, very, very fashionable plant as well which is a strange thing to say about plants but Agapanthus uh, are collected by a lot of people, different varieties, different shades of blue you can get them in white as well uh, my personal favorite is this midnight star which is a very very deep uh, blue a lot of agapanthus tend to be almost like a sky blue uh, but I like the deeper colors um, great in a pot and in actual fact the reason why they're uh, so good in a pot to get them to flower a lot of people have trouble with the uh, agapanthus not flowering you just simply get the leaf is the like the roots c uh, contained so rather than putting them in the garden I would have them in a pot all the time. If you keep them restricted it will send out flowers and flowers and flowers and it uh, looks quite exotic but uh, just giving ordinary compost, nothing special at all, planted in a container and uh, you just get bags and bags of flowers. It starts uh, around about um, 
the uh, end of July right the way up to the uh, middle end of October normally okay, right. and like I say we've got s uh, several different uh, varieties here the Midnight Star uh, we've got the Africanus at the back there which is the the big one uh, and this is a brand spanking new variety it's actually um, only been out a, a couple of days I've only just recently had this in this is the uh, the Golden Drop which is a dwarf agapanthus you know you could have this in a very small pot almost like a rockery type agapanthus small short squat flowers very very light blue but it's got this beautiful banding in the leaf as well stay like I say stays very very compact with this uh, bright uh, golden banding uh, I absolutely love this it's uh, it's going to be uh, adding to my uh, personal collection at home uh, very very soon you keep removing the flower stems almost when they're at this stage when they're just about to pop because the flowers get uh, almost like a perfect ball uh, when they get to this sort of stage you took those uh, flower spikes off had them in a vase in, at home uh, they all come out in flower gives you a nice cut flower in the home and also when you do that it actually sends up more flowers more flower spikes every time you cut one it sends up two flower spikes wow. so it's a good idea to use it as a cut flower as well and I don't know about the viewers at home but my eyes keep getting attracted to this big long tall thing at the back yeah this is is, is that what's going to come from that to that uh, eventually yes similar sort of thing this is Africanus which is a more vigorous uh, variety of agapanthus much taller stems much bigger flowers uh, but the Africanus generally, generally tend to be the lighter blue the sky blues rather than the, the very very deep blue but very architectural plant yeah. um, lasts for such a long time as well a little bit like uh, uh, alliums that you can buy as a herbaceous perennial but these uh, these are fabulous these get bit bigger and better each year uh, when they mature and they get uh, um, restricted in the pot and they fill the pot out you can almost get up to 30 40 flower spikes off the one plant so you can imagine that as a mature plant it's absolutely incredible and that's why I, I love them so much so Matt, what jobs should the viewers and myself be looking out for this month? Well, th this is a prime example, uh, just uh, having a look around the, the nursery and, uh, and found one of my specimen uh, honeysuckles with mildew. Right. And because of the, the way the summer works and you've got the heat and you've got the damp and then you've got heat again, it brings on things like mildew and, and a lot of fungal diseases. I noticed this one has actually got uh, powdery mildew, which is quite an unsightly um, disease, uh, fungus. Um, Left unchecked, it will slowly kill the plant, apart from it make it weakens the plant as well, so you get poor flowering. But it's a good idea to treat it as soon as you see it uh, and, uh, you know, nip it in the bud when, uh, when, when you can, basically. Now, we hear a lot about mildew, uh, mildew from you. Uh, yeah. What actually is it? Uh, well, it's a fungal spore that's, uh, that's in the air and it's brought on by weather conditions normally. It has to be damp and then it has to be warm. Uh, so that just... Uh, the spores are always in the air, but certain conditions brings it on a lot sooner than others. Uh, roses get black spots uh, more than uh, mildew, but they can get mildew as well but if the conditions are right then uh, um, and there's not enough air getting around the plant mildew and black spot can form and can it kill the plant eventually it will it will um, slowly all the leaves will get covered in mildew uh, they can't um, take in the energy from the sun so that eventually dies and looks very very weak and sad and then you end up digging it out but it's a very very easy cure um, easy thing to do, you don't have to have any specialist equipment, it just simply, uh, this is a systemic um, insect, uh, fungicide, fungus fighter, and the reason why I say it's systemic, I can simply, if I, if I just uh, give this a quick shake, make sure it's uh, switched on, uh, give it a quick shake, make sure all the um, product is uh, mixed well, and just, and just literally like that. You don't need any breathing apparatus, uh, specialist equipment or anything, just give it a quick spray. And in actual fact, because it's systemic, that s will now sink into the leaf and work its way around the whole plant. I don't even have to spray the top right. where I can't reach. If I spray just as much leaf as I can where I can actually reach it, this will eventually go around to the whole plant and protect it. Now, a lot of these yellow leaves that we have here, they're the looking particularly bad, they will simply fall off 
and all the fresh new growth that comes out will be completely clean of uh, mildew so you know that it's worked a lot of the older uh, most diseased leaves will just fall off but that's not a problem and it'll just be replaced by fresh green leaves so is there different kinds of mildew uh, there's powdery mildew which is usually on the uh, top and there's downy mildew which is on the undersides mm. of leaves but it's you use the same treatment on both uh, on, on both uh, mildew types of mildew okay and so the the next uh, job of the month which yeah. is um, a uh, another it's a personal favourite to mine because it's quite a therapeutic thing actually. Uh, people think it is a little bit of a chore, is uh, deadheading. And we've got a, a, a David Austin rose here called uh, Pat Austin, really nice fragrant rose. And because it's uh, uh, an old English type, they do need regular deadheading, which isn't uh, too much of a problem. Uh, simply, you take it back to the next uh, leaf joint, just snip it off, nice pair of sec uh, sharp secateurs, and you look around the plant uh, for any uh, flowers that have, have finished or looking past the best that's another prime example and just simply I can get the, oh, the petals are falling off I can get the blade in there just above a leaf joint with a nice slant on it and snip and again we've got another one there if I try and get it without my arms being in the way just again above a leaf joint snip and straight off and the great thing about um, doing this if you do snip it off there's uh, another bit of tidying up there um, if you snip it above a leaf joint, that will actually break into flower bud again and you'll get two flowers where you've just snipped that one flower off. The early flowers in the first part of the season, you only get the single flowers at each leaf joint, but now that will encourage two flowers coming from the same uh, uh, flowering spot. So it's well worth keep deadheading and you get prolonged flowers. It will last throughout the uh, year and uh, you'll get a better looking plant uh, with it. Much more flowers along as uh, a long flowering period as well. So you're only deadheading the flowers that are looking a bit frayed? Yeah, I mean, if, you, uh, if, if I'm being a purist, I would also remove that one. Um, and uh, you wonder why, when it looks so good and so full, well, in the next day or two, that will be doing the same thing. Right. So you've got to think ahead of what's, uh, why you're doing the job. You might as, as well remove a few that are looking a little bit uh, frayed as well. The edges of the petals there are starting to look a little bit tight, so you know that it's on its way out. And in a couple of days' time, that will be looking exactly the same as the ones that we took off so it's probably a good um, a good exercise to take that one off as well so it means you're doing less work and you're not having to get break out the secateurs again um, the other um, jobs that you need to be doing because it's the summer and the the hanging baskets are in full pelt at the moment. Um, make sure you keep feeding, keep watering, and likewise on your lawns, lawns tend to be drying out and starting to look a little bit tired towards uh, middle to late summer, uh, so you can give them a liquid lawn feed, but remembering not to uh, feed those and water those in, in full sun, as you can right. scorch the grass. Uh, but uh, a, a liquid feed, every time you water, just keep them in uh, tip-top condition. Right. If people want to get in touch with you about Swartz and Nursery and about yeah. what you do, yeah. um, how do they go about that? Well, the, the, the easiest way is the, is the phone number, which is o Derby 01332 700 800. Uh, they can also get to us via uh, email, which is info at Swarkston Nursery, remembering the E in Swarkston. Must remember that. Must remember that. Uh, .co.uk, uh, and they can get to us uh, via the website, uh, which is uh, www.gardencentredarby.co.uk. Uh, nice, easy uh, website address to remember. And they can also find us on uh, on Facebook. We have our own Facebook page, uh, which is uh, if you go into Facebook and type in the search bar Swarkston Nursery. Again, remembering the Ian Swarkston, and you'll find our uh, Facebook page there. Okay, Mark. Thanks for that informative uh, talk again.